Hello everyone. My name is Lisa Kiriakides. I'm the handbell director at Aurora United Church where we have two three octave ensembles plus a quintet. I play in the quintet. I'm a member of the Bronze Foundation. I'm the central area rep for Ogre and I'm the secretary for the Handbell Musicians of Canada. So today we're going to talk about choosing music for your ensemble. So I'm just going to switch to my PowerPoint. Just to note that my name and email are at the bottom of every slide, so please feel free to reach out to me that way if you have any questions or want to discuss this further. So I've subtitled this presentation, The Bigger Picture. And it's really important for me, and if you take nothing away from this presentation except for this idea of choosing music as being a bigger picture, then that will be all right, because that's my thesis. So what I mean by that is, is this. So when we're choosing music, we maybe have several different purposes for that. We have an upcoming church service, if we're a church group, or we have a concert coming up, or there's a festival that year, or we're planning for the month, or we're planning for the term, or we're planning for the year. So I want you to really think about how you plan your music and how you choose it and think of it in much larger chunks if you're not already doing it that way. So what I mean is this. <clears throat> the way I choose my music is my ensembles run from September to June. And I divide that into the two terms, September to December and January to June. I choose my music for all three of my ensembles for a term at a time. So I would choose music from September to December and I would choose all the music for all the performances for that term in one go so that I can look at the bigger picture of what experience all my ringers and my audiences are having with the music that we're playing. So I encourage you to do this or to try this idea that you're not just picking music for the next performance, but you're thinking of the bigger picture. So let's talk about some things you need to think about when you choose your music. So the first category I've got here is capabilities. So obviously you really have to take into consideration the capability of your individual ringers. Do you have people that are seasoned ringers and, and have lots of experience? Or do you have beginners or people in between? Do you have people who are willing to take risks or people who are very timid? Uh, about uh, their their abilities to ring your the handbells. Do you have people who can do four in hand? Do you have people who are really scared of compound or mixed meters? Um, do you have people who can uh, change their bells quite easily? Um, and others who really, really struggle with that. So you're looking at that for each ringer. And then of course you're looking at the, your choir as a whole. Your eight people, your 11 people, your 13 people, your 15 people, whatever you have. You're looking at the, as a whole ensemble. What level are they at? Do you have mostly beginner ringers? Do you have mostly advanced ringers? Where can you place your music as far as difficulty that will best suit the majority of your ringers? And then I would recommend that you look at yourself as a conductor as well. So how comfortable are you in a mixed meter? How comfortable are you with compound time? How comfortable are you with things that require lots of cueing or change, change tempos in the middle of a piece? Or, um, you know, that require a lot more cueing for you as a conductor. So think about, put yourself in the mix of that capabilities. Interest. This is a big one for me. So you want your music to be interesting for your ringers, obviously, because you want them to keep coming back. And interesting can be a whole bunch of things. It can be familiar tunes. It can be things that challenge them but are within their grasp. Um, it can just be music with lots of variety, which we're going to talk about later. Um, so also, your music has to be interesting for your audience, whether that be your congregation or whether you're doing a concert. Uh, it's got to be interesting both auditorily and also by watching the ringers. So are they using beautiful, smooth, legato things for a beautiful melody? Or is this a piece that's full of rhythm and full of activity that's really going to delight your audience? And then I think almost the most important one is, is this interesting for you? Because if you subscribe to the way I'm suggesting that you pick your music, where you pick it in chunks... So for the September to December term, I'm picking my music somewhere in July and August usually. 
And so I'm going to be living with those pieces that I've chosen for a very long time. So in July, if I'm picking my Christmas music for, say, our Christmas Eve service in December, I've got to like that piece because I may look at it with the ringers in September and October, but it's going to be for a while. And I really need to like that piece. So for me, when I'm choosing music, so I go through, you know, I, I set all my dates and then I think, okay, and this ensemble's playing on this date and this ensemble's playing this night, I play around with it. And then I look at music out there, you know, is there, are we playing on a specific uh, date, you know, for example, are we playing at the Remembrance service or at the Christmas Eve service, or is this just a regular service? Um, and then I search out there for music. I look at the music we already own. I certainly look at some websites that I'm going to talk to you about later. And I write down all these titles that, that really are starting to interest me. And then I let that percolate in me for a couple of days. And whatever is sort of coming into my brain, those melodies, those rhythms, the, the little things of interest that are kind of coming back into my brain, I think those are the pieces I really need to take a second look at. So then I take a second look at those and I narrow down my list that way. So it can take me a couple of weeks to really come down with the final list. And then of course there's all the budgetary uh, considerations as well. You know, are you borrowing the music? Are you buying the music? Do you already own the music? And so again, music needs to be really interested, interesting, sorry, for me as a conductor, um, because I'm going to be studying that music and I'm going to be playing it with my ensembles uh, for a long time. Level. So we all know that music in handbells is leveled in its difficulty, but I'm talking about just kind of general levels. So you want to have something for your ringers over the term. Again, remember, I'm always talking about music that occurs over a term for me. Some of you might even be brilliant and try to schedule for a whole year. Um, but let's say I'm scheduling for a four month period where my ringers might have four, five pieces, maybe six, if we're stretching it per term to, to prepare for. So I might want to include something that's just a little easier for them than the rest of the music, something that they can whip together fairly fast. Or for example, if I have a short time period from one performance to the next, uh, we have a Carols by Candlelight service that usually happens in the second week of December. And then my ringers also ring on Christmas Eve. So that's a very short timeline between one thing to the other. So if I'm going to pick an easy piece, it tends to be for Christmas Eve, something that doesn't take as many weeks to prepare then I would recommend that you try to incorporate something that's challenging for your ringers. And I don't mean completely out of the realm of existence, but if they're really comfortable at level three, then throw them a three plus, maybe even a four minus, depending on how difficult you think it is, and give them lots of time to prepare for that piece. So that might be a piece you prepare at the end of the term and uh, challenge them. There's nothing greater than struggling, struggling through a piece getting to the end, having a great performance, the feeling of accomplishment is wonderful. Don't make every piece challenging, like super challenging, because then you'll lose all your ringers. And then of course you need to have everything in between of easy and challenging, things that are at their level, little below, little above, you know, that kind of thing. So that again, you're looking at it as the bigger picture, you're looking at it as a term or a year, um, and you can get all those different levels in there. Variety. This is a big one for me. So lots of ways we can have variety in bells. One of them, of course, is techniques. So do we have lots of marting and malleting and all sorts of different things that we can add to the music or the music, it's already in the music, that, uh, that will give us some real good visual uh, visuals for the performance and also fun for the ringers. Melody in different clefs. This is another thing I really pay attention to, and I think it comes from my singing background of being a soprano and always having the melody. Boring. So I think, oh, the treble, the treble ringers always have the melody. Let's move it around. So if I find a piece that has the melody in the battery or the melody in the bass, particularly in the bass where they're not used to it at all, they're just used to playing harmony all the time, 
then that's a piece that will tweak my interest and I might include. I don't want every piece like that, but if I can find a really good piece that has the melody moving into the bass clef, it's such a good experience for the bass clef ringers um, and the battery ringers because they're so used to being harmony. By the way, just a little plug, my next tutorial is on finding the melody in your music, so watch for that one. Use of chimes. If you have the chimes, there are many, many pieces that incorporate chimes and feel free to use them. Is your, does your piece have a lot of rhythmic interest to it? Does it have a lot of melodic interest to it? Or maybe both. And if you're a sacred group, if you are a church group, can you incorporate any secular music at any time? Are you in a concert that perhaps you can incorporate secular music or you're going off site? Maybe you can incorporate something secular. And again, on the flip side, if you're a secular group, maybe add a few sacred things in there. And Every once in a while, try to add another performer. There's so much handbell music written for an additional instrument to your handbell ensembles. For example, violin, flute, percussion, uh, you know, a little four-piece pickup band, singers, narrators, uh, organ, piano. Uh, I'm sure I've missed a whole bunch. So try to incorporate that maybe if you can't every term, maybe at least once per year, that they're working with another performer, somebody that you know that can help you out. You have somebody who plays the flute or the violin who can help you out in this. It's such a great experience for everybody and adds just another wonderful dimension to your ringing. Busyness. So I want you to make sure that all sections of your choir have busy times. And I want to say what I really mean is particularly the top and the bottom of your choir. Those are the two sections where they can be a little less busy than everybody else on a regular basis. So I'm really talking about right at the top of your choir. Let's say you're B6 and your C7 player, and maybe at the bottom of your choir you're C4 and your D4 player. Um, sometimes they can be really busy and other times they don't have a lot to do. Maybe even your G6, A6 player also might not have a ton to do. So I'm not suggesting that every piece has to keep them busy, but make sure when you're looking at it as a whole, you're picking your music um, three, four, five pieces at a time, that there is some piece at least, or at least a couple of pieces where it might address this issue and you're looking at the top ringers and oh they've got some really interesting things to play in this piece or oh the you know the bass ringers they have something really interesting for example they might have the melody or they might have a great rhythm or or you know they switch into chimes or something so so that you have that outside of your choir not being bored all the time and the last thing i really want to say about choosing your music is pick good quality music. And also beware of music that is adapted from other genres, because I'm saying here, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So good quality music, music that you don't mind working with for months and months at a time, things that are well written, well scored, and interesting music that has all the stuff that we talked about in all the other slides. And what I'm talking about music adapted from other genres. So I'm talking about music where arrangers have taken a piece that is written for, let's say, a band, like a pop band, and put it into bells. Or something that was normally um, a solo singer uh, and put that into handbells and arranged that. And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad. I'm just saying you want to take extra care when picking those things. They can be great and they can be a little dry and a bit disastrous. <laughs> um, an example of this is, uh, we did a concert a couple of years ago to celebrate the 200th anniversary of our church. And uh, so it was, we did mostly secular and, and tried to get really, really fun stuff. So I had both my groups together play a Coldplay song. Great song. And in the end, it was a hit. It was a hit with the audience because they knew the, the song. I also had a four-piece band that went with it and uh, all the ringers played, so there was a really good visual aspect to it. But I tell you that during the rehearsal process, it really had some problems or some ups and downs, really. The bass ringers had a great rhythm to play, which they loved. But the problem was they had to play that rhythm over and over and over and over and over again for like 10 pages. And so while at the beginning they were super keen, 
as rehearsals went on, you could see their eyes kind of cloud over with, oh, here we go again, the same rhythm over and over and over and over and over again. And then the treble ringers, they had lots to do, but like a lot of pop songs, the melody kind of changed its rhythms for every verse and that really messed with them. And so there were rehearsals where I had to literally say to my bass ringers, okay, you guys go home early. I need to work with the treble ringers so that I didn't keep the bass ringers there being bored, doing nothing while I had to spend a lot of time. Now, again, the performance itself turned out to be great. It was sort of the climax of the concert and, and it was well received by the audience. And I think the ringers would say it was fun, but there were some pitfalls as we went along. So just be aware, just watch out for that. And uh, you know, some, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So when choosing repertoire, I'm just gonna suggest a few places to get repertoire. This is not a be all and end all list. These are just some resources I use. I'm sure there are other places that you can go to, but this is just where I happen to go. I use handbellworld.com a lot because you can look at the scores and listen to a recording or sometimes a synthesized recording, but at least it gives you an idea in your head what it sounds like. I don't necessarily always buy the music from Handbell World, but at least it gives me a sense of what it sounds like and what it looks like. I can really investigate that. J.W. Pepper is kind of the same idea. Synologymusic.com is a wonderful website. It has music for full ensembles, but where its strength really lies in the music for smaller groups. So you might only have eight ringers or six ringers, or you have a quintet or a quartet or, or a duet, and you want music for that. And on this website, you can also buy the license and simply print the music right then and there. You don't, nothing gets shipped. It's really super convenient. And if you're just looking for, a, say, a piece for a quartet, you can find things that are, I would consider fairly inexpensive because you're printing it yourself. So it could be as inexpensive as $10. Sheetmusicplus.com is another website. Now that's a very large website that has music for all genres, singers, pianists, bands, orchestras, but they have a handbell section. If we want to stick Canadian, we can go to Handbells Etc. from Alberta and the lovely ladies there. They have lots of music as well as lots of handbell supplies. And if we want to go really local, we want to go to Barbara Peeker's website. Here the themring.com. She's in Ontario. You, I'm sure you've seen Barbara at our conferences and workshops. And she's always bringing her library with her. And speaking of libraries, instead of buying music, because we don't all have a huge budget, um, the lending library from Ogre, which you can find on the site that I've put down here, or just go to the website and search for it, um, has almost 400 titles of music for you to browse through and to to borrow and it's a great resource so please don't forget about it uh, and then of course there's borrowing um, from local groups in your area so something maybe you want to talk to your area rep about so there's a piece you want can the area rep you know email everybody and say hey has anybody got this piece and would they be willing to lend it to you um, or do some groups maybe want to switch music? Or You know, there's lots of things and something certainly to talk to your area rep about or just take it on yourself. But, uh, you know, we don't always have to buy our music and sometimes our budget simply won't allow us to do that. So that's all for my presentation right now. I hope you'll join us at the Q&A that follows this presentation and uh, we can have further discussions on choosing your music, the bigger picture. Thanks.